Lija, I guess the floor is yours to talk about the um, programmatic overview. Okay, great. So, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming to the CCPP workshop. So, this talk is the CCPP programmatic overview. And uh, of course, this is very collaborative work that we have been doing with the DTC, but also community partners. So, it represents uh, the work of uh, a lot of people here. Uh, if we're going to talk to the CCPP, and especially if we are going to discuss if we are doing a, a good job and uh, what we should be doing in the future in terms of evolving the CCPP, it is good to talk about the motivations. Why are we doing this in the first place? So one thing is that we want to achieve interoperability at the code level. And interoperability means uh, having the same physics code be usable by different people, different models, uh, host models. And we want, uh, we would like for this resource to result in effective use by a different of num a different types of people. So it should be usable for research. It should be usable for those that are doing development and creating new code. It should be usable for transitions. Uh, and finally, for operations. So we want to have a system that allows a pipeline from uh, people writing new code to getting it in, into operations. So another aspect is code management. We would like to have a system that is efficient in the physics development. And the idea here is centralization. That is, if we have all the physics located in a single repository or at least a single system of repositories that is well coordinated, that will facilitate uh, achieving our goals here. And the other thing is hierarchical structure. So we would like the CCPP to promote process understanding uh, in physics interactions. And by that, I mean that one should be a able to run just uh, one single scheme or multiple schemes to change the order of the schemes to change how the schemes are grouping when they execute a simulation so that hierarchical studies can be conducted but we want this to be not just a good a resource for those doing research with this hierarchical structure we also need the ccpp to be very efficient and run fast for operations so with those motivations, uh, we can now introduce the three main parts of the CCPP. So first one is the CCPP physics, which is a library of physical parameterizations, and you see the authoritative repo there. Second part is the framework, which is a software infrastructure that allows using the CCPP physics in a host model. And then the CCPP is also distributed with its own single column model, which is a simple host model that employs both the CCPP physics and the framework. Finally, I want to mention that we have another repository called the CCPP standard names. That's not code. That's just a number of rules and a dictionary for the standard names that are used as part of the CCPP. And in the technical overview that Grant will provide, you will see uh, why the standard names are important. So a brief history of how it came to be. Uh, we can uh, recall that back in 1989, there was a paper published in BAMS by Eugenia Calne and co-authors in which uh, she talked about uh, certain rules that became known as the Calne rules and how by using those rules and developing your code, uh, you, could lead, you could have better interoperability in terms of uh, sharing the physics among different uh, groups and host models. Uh, this was later revisited oops, uh, by a presentation given by Jim Doyle in 2015 uh, called Revisiting Calne Rules. So as you can see, there was continued interest toward, uh, throughout the years uh, in having this interoperability. This was another event that happened was that in 2016, NOAA conducted the NGGPS Dicor test. That was a test to choose the dynamical core that was going to be used by the next generation global prediction system, uh, which later became the unified forecast system or UFS uh, used by the community and NOAA. So at that time, uh, there was a desire to run different models with different dicors using the 
physics suite of the GFS model, the global forecast system. To do that, an interoperable physics driver or IPD was developed first by EMC and later by the NOAA GFDL laboratory. So that was another exercise in interoperability. Another thing happening is that there is a multi organization physics interoperability team under the auspices of uh, uh, different agencies that have been uh, changing name during the times. First, it was called NUOPSI, then the SPC, and now it's the ICAM. But it's basically uh, a multi-organization effort with NCAR, NOAA, NRL, and other groups uh, that have been discussing interoperability for a number of years. And through this group, uh, there was a specification of the requirements for the CCPP happening in 2016 and 2019. So it's been a very uh, multi-institutional effort from the beginning. But then the first funding to get CCPP really off the ground came from NOAA back in 2017. You see here uh, the first uh, signatures and funding project. And since then, uh, we have received the continued funding from NOAA, and now there is funding uh, coming in from NCAR as well, and uh, of course, in-kind contributions by a, from a larger community. So as of today, we have a different, we have a number of host models using the CCPP. Uh, the CCPP single column model, as I mentioned before, it's used for hierarchical testing and simplified studies. Then we have the unified forecast system, which is a research system, but it's also the code base for NOAA operations. Then we have CMAPS mediator, uh, which is a coupler, not a model itself. Uh, this coupler is used in both UFS and NCAR models. And uh, the reason why it connects to the CCPP is so that on the exchange grid, we can compute fluxes between the atmosphere and ocean. So the point is that the library of physics has code for computing these fluxes. And by this mediator hooking up with the CCPP, it can uh, invoke those routines to compute the fluxes. Uh, CCPP is also connected with the US Navy Research Laboratory Neptune model, which is using CCPP for pre-operational implementation tests. And finally, uh, it is in the, uh, I would say initial steps of being connected with various NCAR models. For example, for the M-cubed, models, WARF, MPAS, or CM1, they are currently converting some of their physics uh, schemes and suites to be CCPP compliant. And for the climate model, the CESM and the Community Atmospheric Model CAM under the auspices of CEMA, we'll mention a little bit later what CEMA is, uh, they're also converting their physics to be CCPP compliant. So that would be the CAM, um, uh, version 7 suite, and there's a lot of work that they are doing in further developing the CCPP framework on top of what uh, the DTC had done before to meet additional needs. So there's also other modeling groups and systems that are in conversation with us and are exploring the use of the CCPP, but those listed here are the most uh, robust ones so far. So the, I wanted just to talk a little bit more about the collaboration with NCAR. So in 2019, NCAR and NOAA forged a memorandum of agreement. And as you can see here on the bottom, I was concluded that the CCPP framework satisfies many NCAR requirements and paves the way for the use of CCPP in NCAR models. Of course, with those additional developments that they are, uh, NCAR is conducting. So uh, up until recently, there were limited resources available at NCAR to actually work on CCPP. But more recently, uh, CCPP has been included as an, as an integral part of NCAR SEMA, the System for Integrated Modeling of the Atmosphere. And that's how uh, it is it's under this auspices that it's being included in the NCAR models. So let's see. Uh, so that was a little bit about NCAR. So now CCPP in the unified forecast system. So as I said before, the UFS is a research model, but it's also the model that's being used for NOAA operations. 
Uh, since that 2017 initial development, there has been a lot of development and then a very detailed testing and acceptance period, such that uh, CCPP is now a cornerstone of the UFS infrastructure. It is integrated in the UFS weather model and it's used for all UFS applications, being short-term short weather, regional, uh, long-term weather, global, etc., all of them. Uh, CCPP went operational just recently at NOAA in June 2023 as part of the Hurricane Analysis and Prediction Systems, HAFS version 1. So this is the first operational deployment of CCPP, and it's now on target for operational implementation in the upcoming global and regional configurations of the GFS, the Global Ensemble Forecast System, GAFS, the Seasonal Forecast System, SFS, as well as the Short Range Weather Application, RRFS. So uh, there's a number of uh, physical parameterizations in the authoritative CCPP repository. Uh, so that's the main branch of our repository. Those parameterizations are of different kinds. So you can see there is microphysics, boundary layer, surface layer, convection, etc. And of each type, there is usually more than one parameterization. So just for microphysics here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six schemes, and that's because some are currently operational, others are planned for future operational implementations, and others are, are used to create diversity in ensembles, and uh, it's also possible to have parameterizations for research and development that are not uh, yet in a, in a final path to operations. And those parameterizations have been contributed by an different number of organizations. So I know it's a lot of acronyms in this slide. Uh, it's not necessary to understand them all, <clears throat> but just uh, to, to see that it is truly a community uh, development effort. So how do we govern this whole thing? Uh, in terms that we have a few governing uh, bodies and mechanisms. One of them is the CCPP Framework Developers Committee. So this committee discusses the upcoming directions for the framework development, and it also reviews proposed changes uh, to the framework, so reviews of a pull request, and also reviews the standard names uh, code repository that I uh, mentioned earlier. Another important body is the CCPP physics code management team that has representatives from all organizations that are actively contributing to the CCPP physics. Uh, that includes all NCAR laboratories, a large number of NOAA uh, research laboratories, as well as the Weather Service and the Navy. And we discuss, discuss how to collaborate in terms of CCPP and how to make the code as interoperable as possible. Finally, uh, we have points of contact for each physics primary scheme. So for each of the, in that table that I just showed, each of those microphysics of PBL schemes uh, has a point of contact. And those people will review proposed changes every time there are pull requests uh, to, the, to a particular scheme. They also assist with the documentation. So I mentioned a little bit about the models that are used using uh, CCPP. And I also want to say that uh, we make a public release of the CCPP for anybody that wants to experiment or develop uh, the code. So the last public release was in June 2022. In the past, those releases have been approximately uh, once a year. The releases uh, happen with some kind of host model, so it's not just the CCPP by itself. In this last release, uh, it was connected with the single column model as well as with the UFS short range weather application. That's the regional application of the UFS. So if you're interested in getting this public release, there is a central hub for the CCPP where you can go get it, uh, get the code, and get also the documentation. Uh, there are 23 supported schemes and six suites in this release. You can reach online tutorial and documentation as well as instructional videos. 
Uh, as far as documentation, we have scientific documentation, technical, and a user's guide. We provide support via the GitHub discussions, and we also have a paper recently published by Dom Heinzeller et al. at GMD. In addition to the public releases, we also, we also issue tags that are associated with the major events of the CCPP, such as uh, other UFS application releases or significant prototypes. Uh, so these are the schemes and uh, suites that were released in the, as part of CCPP version 6. The lines here represent the different types of parameterizations, and you can see in the columns represent the suites. Uh, we have suites that represent operational configuration and developmental configurations. And uh, we have two lines here with those green check marks that indicate which host models each suite is, it works with. So all suites work with the CCPP single column model, but only a few of the suites are meant for working with the UFS regional uh, public release. Another thing to note is that even though those uh, suites are called, for example, here GFS version 16, these are not the code that was that is in the operational version 16. What this means is that these are the schemes used in the GFS version 16, but this is the code as of uh, top of the main branch when the public release was issued. I, I talked a little bit about the documentation. So just to recap here that we have a scientific technical documentation as well as user's guide, online tutorial, instructional videos, and frequently asked questions. Uh, so a little bit more about the single column model. You will hear a lot more in the overview this afternoon. Uh, all supported CCPP schemes and suites are available to the single to, for use with a single column model, as you saw in the previous table. The point of having the single column model for hierarchical studies is that it decouples the physics from the dynamics. So while the physics is let to evolve, let to evolve it does not feed back into the dynamics. All dynamics uh, forcing initial and ongoing to the simulation is, whoops, is provided either from uh, the UFS uh, fields in you know, the unified forecast system uh, initialization and forecast can be used to force the single column model or by few program data and you can see a large number here of few program data some that we the DTC group have uh, created ourselves others that uh, are part of this DEFI case repository which offers a large number of cases and be, since the CCPP Single column model uses this international DEFI format for forcing data sets. We can tap into a large number of cases. So I have a few slides now about what is new and uh, things that we are thinking about that we think are important. And that's why we need to have this workshop is also for you to tell us about the direction we should be going in. So in terms of new things, we have a new and updated physics. We have two new schemes added to the repository recently. One is the Community Convective Cloud C3 scheme, which is a forward-looking convective screen scheme that is originating from uh, both the Grail Freitas and the SAS schemes. And this is still a work in progress um, under development, but it's already part of the main branch. And we have a new lake model, the community land model, uh, CLM lake model, which is a one-dimensional lake model intended for small lakes. We have also updates that are coming all the time to all the schemes. For example, we have an initial single precision capability, thanks to an initial contribution from the Navy and then further work done by GSL and DTC. Uh, we have some GPU compliancy. Uh, so we have now on the main branch uh, GPU version, uh, GPU capability for the GF convection scheme, Thompson microphysics, and the MYNN surface layer. And we have all the schemes that are now operational with the Hurricane system, ongoing development for the various UFS upcoming implementations, and schemes that were made ready by the developers for a number of testbed 
uh, experiments like the hurricane test bed, the hazardous weather test bed, and the hydrometeorology test bed. Uh, so some frontiers that we are working on that are important as more groups adopt the CCPP. We're always looking for ways to increase our community engagement. And uh, for doing that, we're very interested in producing effective documentation. So please give us feedback on that. And uh, we're also interested in continue to support the classroom use of the CCPP and its single column model. So here's an example by Professor Christina Stan of GMU, who used the single column model as a teaching in her classes at, at GMU. So another frontier is more now like the area of physics. Um, in terms of uh, code management, we are always interested in keeping us all going forward together. So we need to have good curation and governance for the CCPP physics. We have to coordinate multiple groups and repositories as groups beyond just the DTC and NOAA are using CCPP. And we're also interested in avoiding duplications. If there are multiple models using the same scheme, we would rather we all use a single version of that scheme and not duplicate. We want to continue advancing interoperability, so we want to exercise schemes in multiple models so that we reach the full interoperability that is our motivation. And we also need to prepare for future needs. So as people are thinking about three-dimensional physics schemes, because CCPP is uh, column-based uh, schemes at this time, so we need to prepare for that as well as for schemes that are entirely or partially based on artificial intelligence, uh, you know, machine learning and other methods. And we also need to have our forefront the inter interaction with chemistry modules. So we want to make sure we can um, either have chemistry in CCPP or interface well with chemistry uh, hosted some other way. And the third aspect of this frontier is uh, pertains to the framework. Uh, so as I said, there is a lot of development happening in the framework today, mostly by our NCAR colleagues. And we want to make sure everybody using the framework can go forward together and use those developments that are happening right now. Uh, interoperability of the framework. So, oops. Different models have different uh, needs for the framework, and we need to continue discussing how to go forward together. And finally, additional capabilities. There is so much more that can be added to the framework to uh, produce greater automation and make our life simpler in terms of using the CCPP and you know using and developing the host models. Uh, finally, another frontier is computational architecture. We need to continue uh, improving the performance of the CCPP and make it adaptable to new architectures such as GPUs. So I mentioned there is already several GPU compliance schemes in CCPP, but uh, as of now, there is not a mechanism to actually execute those GPU schemes in a model. So we are uh, working on connecting those GPU schemes to the host models now. So I think uh, that's it for me. This is my uh, last slide. I wanted to say that uh, we're very interested in connecting with the community. Uh, there's multiple ways to do that. So one is that we have the CCPP hub at dtcenter.org slash CCPP. So you can go there uh, right now, even if you want, and see that you can reach code documentation tutorial support. Our support is mostly provided via the GitHub discussions, but you're welcome to reach out to, to me and our team at any time. And we also have a DTC visitor program, and uh, this is hosted through the DTC. And there are um, instructions at this website, dtcenter.org visitors, about how to apply. We are accepting proposals now and actually accept them throughout the year. So please reach out, propose a project, come work with us. Uh, we can support either uh, PIs, principal investigators, or graduate students. Um, and uh, there's, even though it's called visitors, uh, you don't have to be here for two months or a year. Uh, you can work from your home inst institution and just come visit us uh, as it makes sense. So I think that was all. So thank you and the grant back to you. 
All right. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, so before we, we head on, uh, are there any questions uh, from, from participants at this point uh, related to uh, the content that Lisa just presented? There is one in the chat. OK. Lisa, are you? Can, um, can you... OK, I, have, I think I have to stop sharing to go find the chat. OK, here, I found it. Uh, what is the plan to handle large lakes like Great Lakes and Caspian Sea? Do we need to use active coupling over them? There is an on ongoing JTTI project that I am trying to help. We are planning to bring inline CDAPS capability to FE3 to read in time varying data for Great Lakes. Is there any plan in CCPP side for those kinds of applications? And that was the questions from Ufuk uh, from NCAR. So Ufuk, um, at this time in the CCPP, we only have a plan for one dimensional uh, lake models, which uh, are more applicable to small lakes. As we look at large lakes, then, of course, three-dimensional effects become more important. Uh, in the UFS world, where I, I'm more familiar with, uh, we're planning to use the CCPP CLM lake model for the small lakes and uh, another three-dimensional a lake model for large lakes, and that will be coupled uh, through the, the CMAPs. And you may know even more about that than, than me, uh, because you, are, you said you're working on a JTTI project about that. So I'll be, yeah. I'll be happy to, yeah, you want to say something? Yeah, and I, I don't know anything about that, but so that's, that's the plan. I, I was trying to, to help them to read in the timering data to, because they are trying to see the effect of the lake over the yeah. region. They are also planning to use the sea ice concentration because that also affects the surface roughness and wind. So, and I don't know what's the best ap approach to handle those kinds of things. So we, we discussed with Mariana before to bring sea depth inline capability to FE3. Then you can read in those information and then you can pass it to CCPP and then it will change the results. But Maybe there is more generic way to do it. So I just want to learn it. Yeah, the group that is doing the, you know, the three-dimensional lake model is the uh, University of Michigan and the Great Lakes um, Environmental Research Laboratory. Uh, so Christiane Jablonowski and, and other colleagues. Um, and the model, the three-dimensional lake model in question is the FVCOM. Yeah, I, I I am basically contacting with with her. So okay. at the end of the day, we decide to go with the CDEPS inline capability to read in FVCOM input to a, a atmospheric model component. I don't know. Maybe through the UFS Coastal app, there will be a possibility to online coupling with FVCOM in the future. Okay. Yeah. 